Good morning, church. All right, if you don't know me, I'm Taylor Lazier. I'm the worship director here at South Sound. All right, if you're at home, we're about ready to start worship, so feel free to stand up and worship with us. We begin with Open Up the Heavens. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here You're the reason we're singing Open up the heavens We want to see you Open up the floodgates A mighty river Flowing from your heart Filling every part of our Show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us. Show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our Well, good morning, South Sound family. You guys can be seated. How's everybody doing this morning? Wow. I think we're all tired this morning. I'll just put it up to that. So we are so glad you guys chose to join us this morning. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. Um, Pastor John's always available online if you have any prayer requests or, or need anything. Uh, so reach out to him. This morning, I just got a few announcements for you. First off... Uh, coming up on the 20th of this month is our Ladies Craft Day. If you have any questions at all, um, please uh, talk to Mary, um, who is, uh, sorry, Deborah Wayne, who is putting it on, and she can answer any questions uh, for you as well. There's a sign-up sheet, though, in the back. Please take time, uh, ladies, if you are planning on going to sign up. That way, uh, Deborah can make sure she has all, enough supplies and everything for all the crafts and all of those things. 
Um, also, we have coming up here on the 24th is going to be the kickoff of our Bible studies. Uh, we have a men's and a women's Bible study that are both starting. Men are going to continue their journey uh, through the book of John. If you have any questions at all, um, please talk to Rick Graham, our men's ministries director, um, and he can answer any questions as well. And then ladies, you guys are going to get ready to go through the book of Mark. Um, these are both two really great studies. I highly recommend um, you guys signing up for those studies. Um, if you have any questions um, on the women's study, uh, reach out to Debbie in the office, our women's ministries director, and she can answer any questions you may have regarding that. Also coming up, we have, I don't have my list in front of me, on February 11th, um, if you are new to South Sound and you're wanting to know more about it, wanting to know what it means, uh, who we are, those kind of things, we're going to be having right after service our Exploring South Sound. Um, it's a great event. We recommend uh, you guys to come check it out. Um, if you have any questions, it's a great place to get uh, your questions answered um, there. It is that uh, young adults, if you are between the age of 18 to 25-ish, uh, we add that ish on the end, um, our young adults ministry is going to be having a winter retreat. It's happening over President's Day weekend. Um, it costs us $50 a person. It's February 16th through the 18th. If you have any questions regarding the retreat at all, talk to Ms. Shaley Berry, our young adults director, and she can answer any questions you may have on that. Um, then... It's that time of year. We are going to be, uh, we are, it's, uh, the, our calendar year actually turns over in February for the church, uh, February, March time frame, and we're in the process of uh, nominating and electing uh, new bo uh, board members. In your bulletins, uh, you guys will see these yellow pieces of paper. Um, if there is anyone that the Lord is leading on your heart that you think would make a great uh, board member, go ahead and uh, nominate them. And there's a box in the back. You can drop those, uh, those out. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can also see uh, Pastor Rob or uh, Debbie, and they can answer any questions you may or may not have regarding that. A little bit later in our service, we're going to have a time of offering. If you're joining us online or you just didn't come prepared today, you can give on our website, Safe and Secure. You can actually just click the Giving tab, and it'll take you to our, uh, our giving portal. All right, guys. And this time, if you guys want to stand up, we're going to continue to worship. Let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Savior, 
of heights to the depths of the sea creations revealing your majesty from the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring every creature you song that it sings, all explaining, indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name, you are amazing God, all powerful, untamable, awestruck we to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing God who has told every lightning bolt where it should go or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow in the sun and give source to its light yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night none can fathom indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing all powerful, untamable, awestruck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god 
incomparable, unchangeable. You see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. You see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. I love this song because it talks about the fact that God is indescribable. God does amazing things, and He's He. There's nothing God can't do. So whatever mountain you're looking up to right now and you're trying to figure out what to do, turn to God. Because God always is there for us, no matter what. We can't fully describe everything that God can do because that would put limits on God, and I serve a limitless God. Will you guys pray with me this morning? Father God, thank you so much for your for your amazing, awesome power that you have, God, and the fact that you have no limits. There's nothing in our lives that you can't overcome. So, God, I just thank you so much for who you are and what you're doing in our lives, God, as a church. God, be with Pastor Rob this morning as he brings the word. God, I pray that you will uh, you will speak to us in an amazing way, Lord, and that transformation will happen in our lives. God, we just praise you and we thank you and we give you glory for everything that's going to happen this morning. And it's in your son's amazing name we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. And kids, we are dismissed. Wow. Good morning, South Sound family. How are you guys doing this morning? You know, you ever have one of those days where um, just things just kind of, not everything's going bad, but they're not going right? You ever have one of those days? <clears throat> Sometimes those days are, are <laughs> you're sitting pretty close to your wife. You're, you're within elbow distance, so you got to watch yourself over there, Mr. Rick. As he scoots closer to his dad. <laughs> um, sometimes these days are due to uh, things that you do, but sometimes they're due to things completely out of your control. Uh, today was one of those days for us uh, for technology's sake. So if you're joining us at home, um, I know you're not joining us live because the internet went down in our building. So thank you for watching this when you're watching it. And that's one of the beauties of. Uh, technology is that we can record this service as we are doing now, and we can put it up on the internet later for people to enjoy. But unfortunately, those watching from home for the next hour will not be joining us. I mean, by the time you're watching this now, you are. Okay, never mind. All right, so we're kicking off the new year with a brand new series titled The Money Monster. And uh, money is one of those touchy subjects. They say that uh, when a person gets saved, the last thing that gets saved is their pocketbook. And uh, people that are outside the church, when they, when they come to a church for the first time, if you're like joining us for the first time on a Sunday like today, you might be thinking, oh, great, the preacher's preaching on money. He's going to tell me to dig deep and pull more money out of my wallet and give it to the church. Why? So he could go buy a really nice car or take a vacation. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have uh, seen that. I drive a 2006 Ford F-150 got 200,000 miles on it. It's in pretty good shape because it's been taken care of. It was my pastor's truck before me, Pastor Ron, and when he moved to Arizona, uh, he decided he didn't need a four-wheel drive truck down there, so I bought it off of him uh, for a good price, and uh, I'm taking good care of it because it's going to last me a while. And so I, I don't take extravagant vacations. I think my family, I mean, once a year we drive out to Ocean Shores, and we, we hang out there for a few days. Uh, that's it. 
So that's not where the money's going. It's not going to our beautiful palatial estate of a, a church. Um, I mean, our church is, is great. It, there's plenty of empty pew seats if you'd like to come join us. Uh, we meet Sundays at 10 o'clock here at the church. Um, we'd love to have you join us. But the truth is this, like our church does a lot with very little. And, and this message series, I promise you, is not going to be a please give more money to the church message series. But the Bible does talk about money. And if the Bible talks about it, then we should pay heed. We should pay attention because what God's Word has to say about a subject is important and it has impact in how we live our lives. So, not just inside the church, but outside the church, money is a huge issue. You, you, you never have enough of it. People always want more of it. And the question is, well, how do, how do I get more without doing something illegal or immoral, sacrificing more time away from my loved ones? And, and it begs some questions, like, why does money have such a hold on us? And how can it end up being so destructive in our relationships? You know, I do premarital counseling, and some of the top two reasons for marital issues is money and communication. People fight about money all the time. Money has an impact on our communities and even our relationship with God. So the question is, how can we create habits and attitudes that defeat money as an idol in our lives and instead helps us to put our focus where it belongs, on God. So this five-week series is going to address those questions, and uh, we're going to look at some of Scripture's most important passages about wealth and poverty. In today's uh, internet world that we live in, there are entirely new questions that come up about how to faithfully encourage giving without seeking affirmation or uh, how to share good work without glorifying ourselves. If we want to be like Christ, we, we want to be generous. We want to have generous hearts. But we've all seen these YouTube videos where somebody goes and they record themselves giving some food or clothes or shoes to a homeless person. And uh, no matter how that video makes you feel, whether it makes you feel good about it or makes you feel bad about it, if you go down and read the comments, you'll see that you're not alone, that, that it's very polarizing. You'll have some people that are like, oh, that's so amazing of you to give your own money to that homeless person to, to make their life a little bit better. And then you, you have the other side that says, hey, listen, you're just trying to seek glory. Why would you record a video of that unless you're just trying to profit off of it? And, you know, they say there are three sides to every story. There's their side and there's their side, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. So the question is, how do we... How do we go about trying to be generous without seeming like we're trying to puff up our own ego? There's even been some behavioral science research uh, looking into it. And uh, the research tells us what we already know. There is something off-putting about hearing or seeing people show off what would otherwise be virtuous activities. So you can do good, but if you do your good for other people to see... And you're not doing good for the sake of doing good. You're doing good to say, hey, look at me. And it turns people away. In our world of social media, we can not only show off our financial giving, but we can also use the causes that we choose to support to create our identity online. Some of us use it to align with a certain political party or a social group or to show which communities we belong to and which ones we're against. And we let these things define us. And there was a book uh, written by uh, Deborah Small, Jonathan Berman, and Emma Levine, along with Alexandra Barash, titled, Should You Broadcast Your Charitable Side? And they found that when you do so, it's very polarizing. And we've all heard that, that saying that money can't buy you happiness. And when I talk to my friends that have lots of money, they go, no, but it sure helps. And I can tell you from our own experience that we've had times where 
before we had kids, uh, we had plenty of spending money. And then after we had kids, we had no spending money. You know, a lot of, have you heard the term dink, double income, no kids? They say that like it's a good thing. And I think maybe when that, when that, ter- that term or that phrase was first coined, maybe double income, no kids really meant like you were having double the income and you didn't have as much expenditures. But in today's world, with everything being so expensive, man, if you don't have three incomes coming in, everybody needs to have a main income and a side hustle these days just to pay the bills. I remember when we were living in Bellingham and gas prices hit $5 a gallon, a lot of that was due to the fact that they had to ship it up to Bellingham. And it was an anomaly. It happened the one time, oil prices went back down, but prices started leveling back off to three something a gallon, and we were like, whoo, we had a Suburban at the time. As a matter of fact, one time I, I pulled into the gas station to fill up my Suburban. We were getting ready to go to Spokane for Christmas to, to visit the in laws, and uh, I swiped my debit card and I started pumping gas. Did you know there's a $150 limit at a lot of pumps? So I get done pumping gas, I hang up the pump, the lady behind me starts her car thinking, oh, now I'm finally gonna get to pull forward. And I had to kind of wave at her sheepishly as I swiped my card again, and I had to put another 12 gallons in to finish filling up the tank, because $150 didn't buy a full tank. And she looked at me like, really? And I was like, sorry. She turned off her car and pulled out her book and started reading again. I felt bad for her. If you're watching online, you were so patient with me that day. Thank you. Um, We made it to Spokane and back safely, in case you were wondering. Um... But with the price of everything these days, it's, it's kind of become crazy. And what used to be considered wealthy years ago, decades ago, it's kind of middle of the road now. We think of things like house prices. You know how much house 20 years ago you could buy for half a million dollars? A lot of house. Now when you drive by these brand new communities, that's a starter home. Three bedroom homes starting at 525. And that's a meager house these days. So when we go online, we start looking at what people are posting, and it starts forming their identity of what they're about and what they're against. We start to see the political ideologies come out. And we can kind of see that there's this division. There always has been, but it's more apparent these days because everything's right on the Internet. There's this division between the haves and the have-nots. People above a certain income bracket tend to lean a certain direction. And those below that lean the other direction. And it's not just about the money. There's a lot of other socio-political things going on. But we've seen articles and stories come out about how the wealthy can try to sway elections. To literally buy an election by throwing more money at the candidate that you want in. These kinds of things change the national conversation and they exhort enormous influence on how entire countries can work. But it's also true in less than political ways. In the scripture that we're about to look at, we'll learn that we can flaunt our wealth by giving it away. We can garner influence and fame by showing off our generosity Even with supposedly good intentions, people can end up using philanthropy to gain and exert power. But when we honestly examine our own hearts, we see that our motives are always mixed. The power of money to ensnare our hearts is so strong that we have to consciously avoid glorifying ourselves even in our giving. We need to examine our personal and our communal practices in light of this teaching. So let's open our uh, Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at just four verses here out of Matthew 6, the first four. And there's some pretty powerful words. Starting in Matthew 6, 1. It's a warning. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, 
they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what the right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. According to Craig Blomberg in his uh, Matthew commentary, he says, Jesus' language again is figurative. Verse 3 is literally possible only for those who undergo a lobotomy. And it does not imply that we must not keep track of giving or, or that we are irresponsible in stewardship of finances or that we refuse to disclose how we spend our money for the sake of demonstrating financial accountability. Jesus was simply explaining that the motive for charity must not be the desire for praise from others. In striking contrast stands the common approach to fundraising in many churches and Christian organizations in which lists of benefactors are published often as an incentive for people to give. So in my pastoral classes, in the class on church administration, it talks about this idea. It says, as a pastor, should you know who is giving what? And on the one hand, we have pastors that say, yes, the senior pastor should know what everybody is giving. That way, if somebody's giving declines, you can approach them and say, hey, is everything okay? I noticed you guys have been giving here most months, but now you're down here. Oh, you're saving up to buy a new house. Oh, we completely understand. But on the other hand, there are, there are those that teach, no, the lead pastor should not know because then when you look at somebody whose giving is down here and somebody whose giving is up here and they both want equal amounts of your time, you've got to make a decision. If you only have time to see one, who are you going to favor? And I can tell you right now that I'm not perfect. And so I worry that I might be that guy that favors the person who gives the most. So I've told my board, I don't want to know who's giving. I don't want to know who's giving what. As a pastor on staff, there's a requirement that we are regular tithers. So that's all I need to know. If I ask my bookkeeper, Charlie, if I say, Charlie, is pastor so-and-so tithing? And he says, nope, they're not. Then I have to go have a conversation with pastor so-and-so. But when you come to me and you say, pastor, I, I need to make an appointment with you. The first place I look is my calendar. Not the treasury report. Because I want to be able to give you 100% of my time as your pastor, and I don't want your giving to influence that. Because the truth is this, whether you give nothing or whether you give a lot, if you want to talk to your pastor, you have a right to talk to your pastor. And so I want to be there for you. Now, some of you hearing this might go, oh, whew, pastor doesn't know how much I'm giving. I guess I'm going to give half this much. Please don't. I don't know if you know this, but the entire church operates on the generosity and the obedience, might I add, of its members. Every penny that we earn comes from you guys. We don't have government grants. There isn't money just pouring in out of the, out of the coffers from some benevolent benefactor somewhere. If you are a benevolent benefactor looking for a church to support, might I give you three good reasons why... No, no but seriously, if the Lord has you watching this right now, you know what to do. But that's where I stand. So if you're wondering, uh, should I even call pastor and talk to him about the issue I'm going through because uh, I'm so broke I didn't give this month and I feel bad. Don't feel bad. Those of us who have been called to this position of pastoring, and I'm, I'm going to speak for Pastor John and for Pastor Josh right now. We're not doing it for the paycheck. We're not doing it to serve those who give the most. We're doing it because we're called by God. And when you're called by God to do something, by golly, you got to do it. Those of you that know my testimony, you know I tried running from the calling. I thought that's too much pressure. It's too, I don't want to deal with that. God, you've got the wrong person. I'm too imperfect. And he said, that's exactly why I'm calling you, Rob. Because you've been there. You've made those mistakes. You know what they're going through. You've been through it, so you can relate. The problem with showing off your wealth is it's not merely that it produces pride, but it causes you to misunderstand the entire theological point of giving. 
Just as in the present day, there was also a huge wealth and power gap in Matthew's day. So in the theological commentary on the Bible, it says, almsgiving was a kind of voluntary redistribution of resources. It was consonant with the religious heritage of Judaism in which Sabbath days and Sabbath years protected the poor and the land from overworking on unrelieved exploitation. It's not just about giving modestly, but it's about treating money rightly. So we have to ask a couple of questions, church. Don't answer these out loud. Don't elbow your spouse, but does your giving reflect your belief that all we have is ultimately God's? If you tell me that, hey, I believe that everything that I have is from God, and I go and I look at your bank statement, and I see where you're spending your money, is that going to line up with that statement you just made? Are we treating our money like we're stewards of it and not owners of it? How foolish would it be if I gave Chris $100? I said, Chris, here's $100, no strings attached, it's yours. And then later I said, hey, you know what? Chris, could you turn around and give, give 10 bucks of that to Lenny? Your brother Lenny over there needs 10 bucks. And he goes, no, it's my money. How foolish would that be? I'd say, Chris, I just gave you that money. And I'm asking you to help Lenny out because he needs help. He's your brother. And if you were to say, no, I don't want to give your money. No, you would say, I don't want to give my money to Lenny. I can tell you this. I'm not God, and I'm not trying to put words in God's mouth. But Chris, if that scenario played out, I would be a lot less likely to give you another 100 bucks. I can tell you that right now. I would redistribute that wealth and say, you know what, since you feel that way about your money, I'll just give money straight to, I'll bless Lenny directly, and I'll bless Carl, and I'll bless Jan, and I'll bless Rick and Jay. I'll bless all these other people, but because you felt that way about the money that I so freely gave you, that you were so stingy wanting to hold on to it, then you know what, you get to hold on to it. But that's all you get. When we look up at that verse, it says, don't, don't be like these hypocrites. They've already got their reward. What's their reward? The praises of men. In this life, they'll have people look at them and go, wow, that person has a ton of money. That person gave away a ton of money. That person's so generous. I wonder if I could get some money from that person. I'll tell you what, rich people have problems too. I read an article about depression, anxiety, and how money did not seem to be a factor in that. Suicide rates are out of control, especially amongst the teenage population. And when they started looking at the demographics of these teenagers that were committing suicide, it had nothing to do with economic status. So money can't buy you happiness. And if you feel like you want to give, you got to check your heart to make sure you're giving for the right reasons. You need to evaluate your emotions for giving the money, and we need to reorient our hearts towards justice. Our giving is not about us feeling good. There are times where I've given where I didn't want to give. If I'm being absolutely honest, God's tugging at my heart, and I'm like, no, Lord, no. Yes, this person's holding a sign right here, and the light is still red, but I'm not going to make eye contact with them because I don't, I don't want to give to them. And I feel that tug, and God's saying, no, Rob, give to them. And I don't want to be like Chris in that earlier scenario, but, but Lord, it's my money. And finally, I may, I may give, but it's not necessarily with a warm and fuzzy heart. And that's something that I have to work on and I have to go back to God later and say, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry. Because there's a difference between willing obedience and begrud begrudgingly obeying. Our giving is not about putting band-aids on financial problems. Sometimes we, 
We know that there's an injustice in the world. And there's some organization that is fighting that injustice and we relieve our guilt by saying, you know what, I donated 20 bucks to them. I'm good. It's not what it's about. Your giving to a situation does not excuse you from doing whatever God's calling you to do. You know that we have our coffee out there every Sunday morning. Our coffee comes to us from Camper's Coffee. Camper's Coffee is a for-profit coffee roaster locally, and their proceeds go to fund City Camper's Ministry, which is a homeless ministry. And some of you might be called, you might see the homelessness issue. It's hard to miss it when you're just driving around town. You might see the, the tents and the litter and the people crossing the freeway in dark clothes in the middle of the night. And you might think to yourself, wow, we've got a serious homelessness problem here. So I'm going to put three bucks in the little jar up front and donate to city campers. And so I'm good. And then when God puts on your heart, no, you need to do something for your brothers and sisters that are homeless and have less than you. You go, but God, I gave three bucks. All right, fine, fine. Next time I'll give five bucks. It's not what it is. Money, the, the giving is not there to alleviate your guilt of disobedience. That's not what it's about. It's giving is not so that we can look like good Christians in front of other people. What does that even mean, good Christians? Every time that I've seen a Christian stand up and espouse how good they are, especially in the Scriptures, they were exactly the opposite. Rather, our giving needs to be a reflection of our belief in the goodness and the givenness of God's creation. God tells us that He made everything, this planet. He spoke into existence for us. He gave it to us. And we're His most prized possession. He breathed His very breath into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living being. And from that living being, He made Eve. So God rested, and it says that he saw that everything was good, but when he made man, he said, this is very good. But for the first time, God said something wasn't good in creation. He said it's not good for man to be alone. So he created man to be in community. God has always existed in community. And so we're created in his image. We're created to exist in community. So we need to recognize that since God made everything and gave everything to us, that it's all His. And He, and he gives His creation to us, and he, and he doesn't say, here, just take it and ruin it and do whatever you want. He says, take care of it. He says, be fruitful and multiply, but He does tell us that the earth is here for us. Our giving should be a reflection of God's heart for the vulnerable. There are those around us who have less than, and it's not because they're not willing to put in the work, but whatever their circumstance is, whatever got them to where they are, there they are. And we've got a couple of choices. We could either point out to them where they are in society and shame them, or we can do exactly what God asks us to do, and we can be generous and have a generous heart for the vulnerable. And our giving reflects our belief in our participation, our buy-in into seeking justice for our communities. And there are all kinds of injustice. There's racial injustice. There's socioeconomic injustice. There are entire groups of people that get hated on because of the uniform that they wear to work. I remember when I lived in Bellingham, I used to drive by the federal building and every single Friday, there were people out there picketing. What are you guys against this week? We're against the war. We should pull all of our troops out of said country. Well, do you know what would happen to the people in those countries if we just pulled all of our troops out all at once? They wouldn't survive. Do you know the atrocities that are being committed over there? And there are a lot of countries that go, hey, we don't have anything to do with that. And yet, 
our men and women are willing to go over there and put their life on the line, not just for our freedom, but for democracy's sake in other countries. Those of you who are serving, thank you so much for your service, by the way. So what are we called to do as Christ followers? How does this fit in with our mission? Our mission at South Sound Church is to know Christ and to make him known. To grow disciples who grow disciples and to show the love of Christ to our community and beyond. I'm going to repeat that mission statement, but I want you to think about it from a financial, from a giving and a stewardship aspect. Our mission as a church and with our finances is to know Christ and to make him known. What does our giving, what does our generosity say about who Christ is and how do we communicate that to the rest of the world? To grow disciples who grow disciples. It's our duty not to just practice good stewardship habits, but to teach that as well so that the next generation can understand how to be generous and how to obey God with their finances as well. And to show the love of Christ to our community and beyond. If we want to give like Christ, we have to develop a heart like Christ. When we see somebody in a position that's worse off than us, our heart needs to break for them. Our first thought shouldn't be, well, how did they get here? Our first thought should be, how can we help them out of this situation? And then we can continue to educate them how not to fall back in. That's what loving like Christ looks like. And I'm going to say a prayer and I'm going to end my sermon, but I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And we're going to close out with a song and the ushers are going to come forward and we're going to take our offering during this song, so I'll pray over that too. But here's the bottom line, church. God wants a lot more than our money. He wants our hearts. So where's our heart today? Father God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to gather as a church family, to get into the Word and to hear what you say about showing off our wealth. God, I pray that those who have much will loosen up their grip and they will learn to trust you with the finances that they've got from you. And they will seek your will and how they should distribute that wealth. God, and those who do not have, I pray that you would help them to lean into you and trust you and know that you will provide because you are the great provider, God. In a world that seems so dark and hopeless, God, you are our source of hope. And I pray that not just those here today or those watching online, but people, the world around would would learn that Jesus, you are indeed our living hope. It's in your name we pray. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine
such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to silence a roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to part of our mission statement, we talk about growing disciples who grow disciples. One of the ways that we're going to do that throughout this five-week series is we're going to have a weekly stewardship challenge. So our challenge for this first week is to start a gratitude journal. Start a gratitude journey. Start writing down somewhere in the same place, a notebook or something, when God has done something that, that you feel grateful for or should feel grateful for. So take a moment each day this week to jot down three things that you're grateful for. It's a small step, but I think it's going to make a big difference in our outlook on life and on our finances. And I'm going to encourage you, don't just do it for this week, but as we continue, maybe continue to do that. And as you you stop to pray, when you feel like, oh man, there's, there's nothing to be happy about right now in your present situation, you can look back in your gratitude journal and say, oh, but wait, God is good. 
And I can see that there's evidence in my own life that God is indeed good. And I believe that as we become more grateful for the things that God has given us, it starts to change our heart and the way we see everything, not just the money, but everything else that God has given us as well. Our relationships, our, our jobs, the stuff that we have, and the money itself, we all start to see that as a blessing from God. So hey, I love you guys. God bless you. You are dismissed. I'll see you out in the foyer.